بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I would like to welcome everyone especially of our um, honorable guests Faisal Ali Qaisari and uh, a friend of our institute and a supporter of our efforts, Professor Farid al -Attas. I'm very happy to see him again here. He has been working with us together on similar event organizing, initiating, and it's a pleasure to sit with him and with all of you today. I thought one aspect of creativity in our program is now gone. <laughs> so I hope that we can uh, perhaps bring some of it in our discussion. The subject today, uh, Muslim intellectuals, freedom, and creativity. Itself, I think, uh, takes for granted this Islamic context. So I will be speaking on this subject from the viewpoint of Islam. Uh, it so happens that I have also published a book, Freedom of Expression. I should have added maybe in creativity <laughs> in Islam. <laughs> but uh, freedom you may have, it doesn't follow that you are also creative that uh, it is probably a precondition. It is necessary that you uh, have freedom in order to be creative. But it does not follow that uh, freedom will lead to creativity. It takes um, positive effort and encouragement uh, to bring about what you call creativity. I guess when you speak of Muslim intellectuals, freedom and creativity. We are not talking necessarily about creativity in the scientific field. It's uh, in social thought and religion, it's not the issues are not black and white. We do have a lot of creativity in our, I think the discourse, the kind of the course of events to some extent, it's inevitable, the kind of uh, pressures that we have in the intellectual world, that we make an assertive effort to make our education, our intellectual kind of uh, exercises creative in order to be relevant. But there are, in, in addition to in people's thoughts and minds in the Muslim world, religion comes the first aspect of relating to these two, freedom and creativity. But religion is only one aspect, which is an important feature. I will be speaking on what Islam has to say on these themes. But uh, culture is also an important element. You may have, for example, a very good constitution, not only recognizing freedom of expression, but guaranteeing it and so on. And yet, if you have an unappreciative culture and environment, it may not really, the reality may be a different thing. Another aspect that is closely related to these, to creativity especially, is education. And I think it is commonly acknowledged and that uh, that must be the main, the major, the principal context where you bring about intellectual creativity. And whether religion is recognized and does play a role, a supportive role, to encourage creativity or the opposite of that, to suppress it. This is an open question and does require some investigation to ascertain uh, whether which side may be the predominant 
Every religion has its a big mix. Religion, when you speak of Islam, you cannot really classify it in one way or another. You have to look in. And we look here within, and you find different elements, um, sort of uh, some supportive, some also restrictive. History and the kind of philosophy, philosophical outlook that you uh, might be having, and maybe other factors, they all play a role in encouraging creativity and uh, politics. Politics, I think, uh, is a major, major factor. I will be developing this subject of freedom of expression and creativity, but immediately it comes to mind that there was a period of history in early Islam that we had the period of the Prophet's lifetime and the companions and and then the followers and the era of ijtihad, the efflorescence of Islamic religious and legal thinking, the emergence of the mazahib, for example. These mazahib, although they become eventually an instrument of restriction, but they were, unless you have an original creative contribution to make, there will be no mazhab coming into being. Uh, these mazahib can, could not be repetition of one another. They have each had aspects of original contribution, and it is that way how they became a mazhab in the first place. And yet it is uh, ironical to see that after the crystallization of the mazahib, we have another phenomena the closing of the door of ijtihad and then the domination of taqlid. Why these two contrarian sort of development in the history of Islam, the efflorescence of, you know, intellectual creativity, and yet just the opposite of that. And I believe it is authoritarian politics and the kind of movement developments that we had at the very early stage. I'll be referring to these. I'm throwing out these strands of thought. Maybe later I may be able to uh, put some ideas together to give this discussion a certain structure and shape. But I think it's better to perhaps, you know, open, speak openly on the subject. I said that uh, religion is generally associated with restrictiveness, limiting authority structure. You are talking about divine revelation, the messages and that uh, you are supposed to follow. Right? There is not a kind of a recipe for free thinking, so to speak. But every religion has its own history. Not all of them can be classified in the same way. Islam itself emerged in an open environment, a desert environment. Among people, you might be inclined to think that they were naturally freedom-loving, that they were naturally <laughs> inclined to be against restrictiveness, the tribal structure of society that surrounded those events. They were also resistant to imposition from outside. Yet within the tribal structure, you have those elements of restrictiveness as well. Islam itself will, can be characterized as an uprising for justice and uh, very strong on its messages on moral virtue and spirituality. When you look into the sources of Islam, you find impressive uh, messages uh, in support of freedom, freedom of thought uh, and uh, uh, releasing from the yokes of history people that suffered from restrictions and so on. The prophets 
personal experience of migration, hijra. It is to find a release from the kind of impositions that and the uh, oppressive experiences of the Quraysh in Mecca that they expose Muslims to kind of unacceptable restrictions on their freedom of religion. And therefore, it was unacceptable to the, the movement, the Prophet himself, and he found a way out of that, and that became Hijra, a major event. Towards a different environment. It's an exercise in freedom, if you like. These are some of the major kind of developments in early Islam that uh, have really been kind of shaping um, the history of intellectual efforts that came after. The spirit of Islam is perhaps predominantly supportive of freedom. Uh, the early history suggests that. The early companions, they were known for this kind of consultative exercise and in intellectual, their discussions, and they were not really restricted by so many aspects that not even the political aspects. In their contribution to the creativity aspects of Islam is something that we um, you know, often talk about. We had the movements of Ahl al-Ra'ya and Ahl al-Hadith, people who stood for the freedom of opinion, for creativity. We had the movement, the Mu'tazila, for example, the rationalists. But eventually this confrontation between the two, uh, the forces of restriction and the forces of intellectual creativity and freedom, they began to confront one another. Instead of being moving in the same direction as Islam started uh, at first, they confronted one another, and because of political developments and so on, it was the latter, uh, traditionalist and restrictive aspects of Islam that won the day. The Ahl al-Hadith and the kind of the Ash'ariya and so on, they dominated the rest of our history in Taqlid imitation of the authority of the past. It became a kind of uh, burden on intellectual creativity and freedom that we uh, were unable to rid ourselves, uh, even to this day. Although there have been significant attempts in every period of our history, one major was uh, early 20th century, Muhammad Abdu and uh, Jamaluddin al Afwani, and then their disciples, calling for the revival of Ijtihad. And uh, al Afwani was emphatic on the importance of politics in this. He was right. Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Radha, they, in, they worked on the intellectual aspects of uh, Sharia and religion. There are other aspects within religion that uh, present you with a mix of influences, like uh, the development of uh, kind of the tradition of literalism that dominated interpretation <coughs> in tafsir, for example, the valid tafsir is tafsir bil ma'asur, uh, as opposed to tafsir bil ra'ya. Tafsir, if you interpret the Quran and you follow the precedent, the recognized precedent, and you move close to that, and if you move close to the text, the letter of, in the words of the text, that was the idea 
that you are on the right path, not that you bring, you know, uh, free thinking. Or although we have recognized tafsir bil ra'ya, and we have recognized, for example, allegorical interpretation, tafsir majazi, for example, as opposed to the literal word for word interpretation. And yet this intellectual kind of you know, restrictiveness that the literalist tradition dictated, and this has remained a very strong influence in our intellectual history uh, and the development of ideas. With these influence, the tradition of education in the masjid, in madrasa, and so on, they adopted this respective approach. There may be certain other aspects why they became so, but I wouldn't widen the scope of this discussion, but to just say that what we made of ijtihad and fatwa and the halal and the haram, yes, you have in religion these aspects, but how you utilize it and whether you recognize the you know, the Qur'an itself tells you that the haram is very specific, that we have specified in detail what is haram, whereas the halal in the freedom aspect is not specified, it's open. The haram sphere compared to the mubah in the halal and the mandub in these other categories is very, very limited. And yet we find that it became this haram that became the common language of our mullahs and speakers and ulama. Why this limited aspect of Islam began to dominate in the wider aspects of culture and uh, creativity. Uh, this is the kind of struggle, the uh, history, the negative trends that dominated. Ishtihad begins to be the moving force of the mazhab, and yet by the end of the day, the mazhab becomes an instrument of the suppressing ishtihad. Without ishtihad, the mazhab would not be there, but then they themselves dictated to their followers that now you must follow the ruling of this mazhab. And you will be surprised to hear that towering scholar of Islam like Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he writes in Al-Mustasfa something very surprising. He says that in our time and age, the mujtahid do not exist. It is extinct, those independent mujtahidun and scholars, they are no longer with us. Because of this, the taqlidi thinking, and that we are today, every scholar in alim is supposed to be following the mazhab and the lead of the past authority. And centuries later, another prominence, alim, a Shia, a Zaidi Shia, al-Shawkani, from the Yemen. Uh, he writes in his book, Irshad al-Fuhul, Min Tahqiq al-Haq ila ilm al-Usul. And did al-Ghazali forget himself? He was a mujtahid. That was the kind of climate. And then he doesn't simply say that, but he quotes a series of prominent mujtahidun and every century, in every period of time. Uh, you know, we have given these great names, Shams al aima and Alauddin al kasani for example, and uh, many, many other ulama, Ibn Taymiyyah, al-Shatibi, and not just in Sharia, but in other fields. And he says it's a big exaggeration to say that door of ishtihad was closed, that the independent thinkers were no longer with us. 
they were there, but that was the climate of opinion that uh, then you have within religion also this something developing by the name Beda, we earlier mentioned in our Kullu Beda Dalala. Every innovation is misguidance. Although Beda itself, a Beda is something harmful innovation, contrary to the recognized practice, the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the valid precedent. Beda is something that goes in the opposite direction. Beda is a big chapter of, you know, this intellectual creativity, and there is a lot of detail, not just one kind of Beda, but Beda Sayya and Beda Hasana. And we don't know the origin of this. How did it come about? But we hear that it was this, uh, that the, the Ramadan, the free, the Salat al Taraweeh. At one time it was practiced during the Prophet's time. Then they forgot about it. For a long time they did not do it. And then uh, during the time of Omar al Khattab, or a companion started practicing it and he heard, oh, he said, this is a Beda Hasana. This is a good Beda. How you call that a Beda? And you pray. That is something that then the ulama began to use Beda as a kind of a religiously loaded concept. And that someone who is committing Beda is authenticity, uh, religious authenticity is questionable. But then there were certain movements and currents of thought, uh, like the Bataniya, the Bataniya or Ta'limiya and the Ismailiya, they're all the same people, a group of the Shia and they propagated certain <coughs> thoughts that they were considered to be beda. Like uh, these five pillars, zakat <coughs> means purification of the soul, not the zakat that we know. Psalm or fasting means abstinence from evil, not that you don't eat or drink. Uh, salat means it's a reference to the Prophet himself. In Salata Tanha Anil Fahsha Iwal Munkar, that uh, Salat uh, prevents you from evil in lawlessness. They say that it is a reference to the Prophet. He was the one who staved off people from evil conduct. When you read this kind of interpretation into the pillars of Islam, this is what Beda, this, this is Beda, Beda Sayya, which is unacceptable to the people. There is something that there is in it, in the concept, it's not just, you know. But then later Al-Shatibi, the author of Al-Muwafaqat uh, from Andalus, a prominent thinker, he became critical of this kind of overload on Beda. He said, the Beda of today becomes the Maslaha of tomorrow. If you don't know something, it's become common that any innovation is just labeled as Beda. Why should this be? Most things that are new, over time we realize the benefit of this and then we call it Maslaha. So there is a, a kind of both aspects of this uh, intellectual creativity. That, but in the Quran, we also read, I think, the basis of this intellectual creativity and freedom of expression, if you refer to the text, is the idea of hisbah, that is, amr bil ma'roof wa anil munkar promote good and pre prevent evil. This is used as a major aspect of 
intellectual freedom in Islam. It's a very Quranic, uh, several ayat in the Quran that encourages and gives a certain sense of direction and purpose to how you exercise freedom. That you exercise it in promoting something good and uh, not to promote something evil. That is how you uh, encourage and work with other in the promotion of something good. Interestingly enough, wal mu'minun wal mu'minat awliya ubaduhum ala baad ya'muroon bil ma'roof wa yanhawna alil munkar. That the verse refers to al mu'minun wal mu'minat, men and women, believers, men and women, they are awliya supporters, if you like, wali of one another. And they promote good, and they prevent evil, and they have faith. Uh, this is the language of the Quran. First, there is this equality between men and women in respect of something very major, when that is Amr bil Ma'roof in Nahyan al Munkar. This uh, scholars tell us Al Ghazali called Hisba Al Qutb al Azam Fiddin, the major, major pole of religion. Her government is a department of Hisba, such a uh, governing principle, because this is what government is supposed to be all about promote good and prevent, prevent evil. And this is how freedom of intellectuals should also be guided. But in another reference to the same idea of Hisba, Ya'murhum bil ma'roof wa yanhahum anil munkar, these are the believers, then the reference to the Prophet, wa yada'u israhum wal aglala allati kanat alayhim. That the job, the principal mission of the Prophet are three things. One is this Hisba. And the other, to remove the yokes of the path from the sh shoulders of the people and the kind of restrictions that burdened them. And this is the kind of the task of the Prophet assigned in the Quran. Then the Prophet himself, in a hadith, say, قُلِ الْحَقَّ وَلَوْ كَانَ مُرًّا Say the truth, even if it be unpleasant. <coughs> and you are aware that the Qur'an was a major promoter of this commitment to the truth. And that, uh, in fact, one of the periods of the efflorescence of scientific thought in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries the efflorescence of Islamic scientific tradition is partly explained by reference to Quran's invitation, Quranic invitation to explore the truth, to investigate the world around you, to find out the creation. And the Quran itself call all of its contents by this one reference is ayah, ayat. Ayah has two meanings. One is a text, the Quran, the other is a sign. And there are 6,000 over ayat in the Quran. And these are all ayat. And following the idea of alayat adabbaruna fil Quran, don't they think about the Quran? Have they locked their intellectual ability to discover? the world around them, this and that. A lot of this in the Quran, I think that so much so that it changed the early, the Hellenistic <coughs> tradition of this theoretical knowledge that the Quran, even the Muslims for two or three centuries, the Quran commentators missed out this point as Muhammad Iqbal has told us that the Qur'an is anti-classical, that it is promoting this inductive 
experimental knowledge is full of these references, go in, investigate the world, and so on. This is a kind of intellectual freedom being encouraged in a certain way within a certain framework. Again, the prophet, you will see, I'm, you know, the elements that you have within religion. When you see my Oma, that is scared and afraid to tell to a Zalim, O oh Zalim, then it's no longer worth belonging to this Oma. Then leave it alone if this Oma becomes so intellectually suppressed and morally uh, kind of uh, does not have the courage to say that. Another hadith, Afdalul Jihad, Kalimatu Haqqin, Sultan al Jair. The best jihad is to tell a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. Uh, we are looking into, within the tradition, la ta'ata fi masia, the limits of obedience. You talk about this despotic politics, but when you look at the normative instructions, I think. This does not really tally well with that. that there is no obedience in transgression. Obedience is in rightful conduct. And that also tells us, the intellectual readers, that freedom in, within the Islamic framework is not freelance thinking, but a guided kind of freedom. That. Uh, it must be in the service of something good and constructive and beneficial. Not that we have always had this. We are a mix of, a big mix of, you know, different kind of influences. This uh, is human being generally, but... Also with reference to religion itself, la ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion. فَمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ فَلْيَأْمُنْ أَوْ يُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ مِنْكُمْ فَلْيَكْفُرْ This is the kind of language you find in the Qur'an, but if you go and promote this in, from the khutbah on the day of Friday prayer, people will look at you, are ah, you a libertine? Uh, you know, that kind of uh, yeah. respective environment, taqlid is alive with us, whereas uh, in the text you find something different. Another aspect of freedom of expression in Islam is uh, like uh, religion is characterized in a hadith, ad-dinu an nasihatu that religion is good advice. People say, what is then, what does it mean? An-nasihatu uh, imadu din this is the pillar of religion. The other thing is that companions ask to who? To your leaders, to your brothers, to everyone. That is the essence of Islam. In other words, it means to me that Islam is not always to read from the text and to guide your life every day by looking at the text. No. If you don't have, no religion can tell you and guide you in that way. Look into your you know, in intellectual lights, what advice you get from your, you know, sound conscience and enlightened conscience. That is religion. In other words, nasiha, giving nasiha, that is the subjective aspect. The external application of nasiha is that you advise the leaders, the political leaders, to correct them when there is an instance of that. In the Qur'an also this idea فَإِن تَنَازَاتُمْ fi shay'in, If you dispute over, and this is that the Qur'anic ayah, أَتْوِعُ اللَّهَ وَأَتْوِعُ الرَّسُولَ Obey God and obey the Messenger, but if you dispute, the audience is the ruler and the rule. 
wa ulul amr minkum you follow the ulul amr but if you dispute something with them then so disputation is allowed political disputation is allowed and uriyat naqd al hakim also called huriyat al ma'arada there is freedom that you criticize constructively criticize the rulers people have done this to the early caliphs uh, telling them that you have done this and that and that was uh, permitted you have huriyat al bayan huriyat al qaul then you have freedom of assembly and association when you read in the quran ta'awanu 'ala al birri wa at cooperate with one another in this and that when you read that you command good and promote evil this is not all individual effort these are in plural ta'awanu so there is a freedom of uh, joining together for that finally i will quote uh, one quranic verse in end to welcome those of my servants who listen to the word and follow the best of it wa bashir ibadi allazina yastami'una alqawla fa yattabi'una ahsanahu this is an interesting verse the qawl is a reference to the quran that they listen to the word maybe other qawl as well but then follow the best of it. they give it the best interpretation and then they follow and support that best interpretation you may have different interpretations and uh, you listen to all of them but then you choose what is the best so this is a kind of uh, within the quran <coughs> itself and there is the permission that you select the mufassirun ask the question is there something like the best and the less best in the quran and that which is not so good uh, are we allowed to make these distinctions because uh, the quran uh, yes if you look at the quran yes there are so many things and so many interpretations and so many people tell you but you judge for yourself which is the best and what is what is meritorious to follow i've taken longer than perhaps i but thank you very much assalamu alaikum